Queen's door. I, I, I found this. I think it could be what Elianaris' heralds are referring to. He placed the paper he'd unearthed down on her desk and then quickly turned it round so that she could read it. Rather than loom over the desk, he took the liberty of sitting in the spare chair. And yet his office was small, but fortunately there was just enough room for a guest to sit down. Years of practice meant that Anietta was able to quickly scan the document and get the gist of it. He watched her eyebrows rise at least twice, but she said nothing. Not until she got to the end. Ah, Vandor the White, wasn't she executed for sorcery? I, I think so, he said somewhat sheepishly, but as far as I can tell there was nothing wrong with the technical merits of her plan. Overview. Elianaris, the commander of the Golden Armies, the queen of the Fields of Glory, is angry with the Empire. This is not unusual. All the Eternals of Summer are prone to fits of rage that pass like a summer storm, but Elianaris is perhaps the most famous for her fiery demeanour. Yakti the Cowled, a wise Varushkin archmage who served in the time of Emperor Hugh, famously called her an intemperate child trapped in the body of a mighty warrior. Though, obviously, not to her face. The cause of her rage this time is that the Empire has called on her aid too many times, apparently without publicly thanking her for this support. Thus, the Lion of Summer has thrown a strop and refused to let the Empire play with her toys until they make it up to her. Quite how this would be accomplished has been extraordinarily vague to date, but after some coaxing, the civil service has been able to identify four ways in which she could be placated or pleased. Will you tell me why? Doubtless there are some perceived slights or comments that have offended the Lion of Summer, but the true cause of her anger seems to be the many castings of Knights of Glory which have taken place in recent years. This powerful ritual draws on pacts with Elianaris to call a host of her heralds to issue forth from the Summer Realm to join an established army and fight alongside them on campaign for a season. Because the ritual draws on the power of the Lion of Summer, it could only be created with their agreement. There are many such rituals in Imperial law, all of which require the agreement of a single Eternal to function. Because these rituals draw on the power of the Eternal, they come at some cost to the Eternal in question. These costs are not always clear, but in the case of Knights of Glory, one cost at least is very obvious. Many of her knights that issued forth fell in the battles they fought in, never to return to serving their queen on the fields of glory again. Sometimes an Eternal wants Imperial magicians to cast a ritual that draws on their power for reasons of their own. A ritual like Challenge the Iron Duke clearly requires considerable time and energy by the Duke, but they appear to relish setting challenges for people. But using a ritual that draws on their power costs that eternal something, so in most cases they will expect something in return. It is always a mistake to assume that the eternal will be gratified by casting a ritual that draws on their power. It is much safer to expect there to be a price of some kind. That might be as simple as gratitude for a favour given, or respect for a friendship honoured. When some autumn rituals like before the throne of Estavus, the price forms part of the agreement. One thing is clear. The more powerful the ritual, the greater the debt. It is important to stress that Elianaris cannot refuse to answer the summons when Knights of Glory is cast. Provided the Empire do not break the agreements made when creating the ritual, her host must issue forth in response. What the Lion of Summer can do, what she has done, is throw a temper tantrum, refusing to talk to the Summer Archmage and issuing vague threats to lend all possible assistance to the Empire's enemies should they cast the ritual again. As a result, the Empire has chosen to deny itself the use of the important ritual for fear of the Queen's vengeance. 
The Summer Archmage has worked tirelessly to resolve the dispute. Now, thanks to their efforts, the Empire is in a position to mollify the Eternal, if they are prepared to pay the price. The Safe Route Mollifying Eleonaris is likely to require a Senate commission. One proposal is a folly ceded to Eleonaris requiring at least 30 wains of white granite and 60 crowns to build. The civil service has proposed that the Summer's Rose in Semahome would be the ideal location for such a monument. In the beginning, the Lion of Summer might well have been placated by a suitably worded synod judgment praising her prowess and majesty. The throne might have used their powers to address the Empire to issue a decree, thanking her for her aid. Historically, the Lion of Summer has been impressed by words of praise issuing forth from the individual that they see as their temporal and moral equivalent in the mortal world. The Senate might have passed a motion, thanking her, or the Conclave could even have used a simple declaration to ensure the mistress of the fields of glory felt appreciated. Sadly, the window of opportunity for such measures has long passed. The Lion of Summer is seething, and those storm clouds will not break until the Empire takes concrete steps to prove the respect with which they view the Sovereign in scarlet and gold. In short, the Empire would need to build an appropriate commission, and someone would have to pay for it. The safest option would be to construct a suitable folly and cede it to the Lady of Penance. It would need to be a significant construction and be built in such a way that reflects the glory of the proud Eternal to whom it would be given. One possible site that the Imperial prognosticators have identified is Semmer's Rose in Semmerhome. Famed for its shrines to the exemplars and paragons of Dornish history, the Empire could commission a monument to celebrate the glory and sacrifice of the many elfin knights that have sacrificed themselves in their cause. The Lion of Summer is bound to be flattered by a monument to Her Majesty placed in such a prestigious location. The commission would take a season to construct and would require 30 wains of white granite and 60 crowns to build. If the commission, or something of comparable size and prestige in another location, was completed and ceded to Eleonaris, then her temper would break and the entire conflict would be rapidly forgotten. Well, at least until next time. The adventurous options. Alternatively, a fane might be commissioned to placate Eleonaris. This new commission would require 10 wains of mithril, 10 rings of ilium and 20 crowns. The civil service have identified two potential regio where a fane might be gainfully constructed. A much more adventurous option would be to construct a fane. The imperial conclave directed the civil service to investigate the construction of an embassy to the summer realm, but nobody was certain what such a structure might entail. After lengthy research, the nearest thing anyone can identify that might work similarly is based on an ancient design that was created by a Dornish enchanter called Arvandor the White. Arvandor claimed to be a direct descendant of the Swan, and was said to be overcome by Ardor for the mistress of blizzards. She sought to create a fane as a way to win the Lady of Frost's favour, but she was executed for sorcery before she could gather all the materials needed. To construct a fane that might impress the Lion of Summer, the Empire would need to identify a suitable Summer Regio that would have to be ceded to Eleonaris along with the fane itself. The commission would take a single season and require 10 wains of mithril, 10 rings of ilium and 20 crowns, but once complete, it would create a powerful warding that enabled heralds of the Lion of Summer to come and go as they please throughout the region it was in. The fane would grant Eleonaris the ability to build any structure she chose on that site, much like Lolfir did when it established its garden in Rykos. Constructing a fane would require the Empire to trust the motives of the Lion of Summer. There are clear risks involved, so the civil service has prepared a separate briefing on fanes. Although the magic involved is innovative, there is no doubt it will work but the approach has never been tried before in the Empire. Discussions with the Heralds of the Lion of Summer have revealed that the Yatoon have long pursued this approach, or one very like it, and have ceded at least one fane to most of the Summer Eternals. 
This is the method that they are using to secure the aid of Elianaris in their war against the Empire. The Yatun have few ritualists with a fraction of the power of Imperial magicians. To construct a fane, the Empire would need to locate a suitable regio. Not just any powerful summer regio will do, it must be one that is already under the influence of Elianaris. Such things are not common, but careful diplomacy with her servants has allowed the civil service to identify three possible sites. The Giltmere Weaving in Astolat is the centre of learning for ritual magics, but it was also the birthplace of Adelmar the Lion, who some people claim enjoyed the patronage of the Lion of Summer. Either way, she is known to have a fondness for the area, and the weavers in the area often report encounters with her heralds in the shallow foothills to the north of the town. The source of these encounters is a regio claimed by the Lion of Summer, a strange tarn called the Giltmere. Legend has it that there is a great ram that lives near the Giltmere, whose scarlet and yellow coat burns with an inner fire. Weavers often scour the hillside looking for scraps of wool pulled from the great ram's coat. If you can collect enough of the scarlet thread, it can be spun into a secret burning thread that is said to imbue any garment that is woven into with all the passion of the summer realm. Ormont Rather than cede the Giltmere to Elianaris and allow her to claim it and the surrounding foothills, the Empire could choose to build a fane on the site of the Ormont. This huge mountain is one of several great peaks found in North Spires, most of which tower over the surrounding countryside. The mountains here are rich in orichalcum, which may explain the Lion of Summer's interest in the mountain. Ormont is not the tallest peak in North Spires, but there are ancient ruins halfway up the mountain that legends claim were once the home of a being called Quiet Solace before dawn breaks. The creator of the ruins is centuries gone, but the mountain retains a foreboding appearance, and locals claim that when lightning flashes during a storm, it is possible to see griffins circling the peak. The Dangerous Choice a final alternative involves building a fane at the Semestones in Semmerholm. The Semestones are currently not aligned with any one Summer Eternal. Recognising Elianaris's claim to this powerful regio would win Elianaris's approval, but would greatly anger Maraud, Cathan Canet, and Jaheris. A large folly built somewhere suitable would be sufficient to demonstrate that the Empire was appropriately grateful for her aid. Her restrictions on the use of Knights of Glory would be lifted, and the Empire would be free to make use of her aid again, at least until the next time she decides to take umbrage. Creating a fane in either Giltmere or Ormont would achieve the same outcome, but it would also win Elianaris' approval. She would be positively inclined towards the Empire, and the fane would make it easier for the Empire to stay on her good side in the future. There is, however one more option that the Empire could consider. The Semestones. The Semestones in Semmerholm is arguably the most famous summer regio in the Empire. It is certainly one of the oldest and its power is said to rival that of the regio at Anvil, for the Summer Realm at least. It has a long association with the Summer Realm and has been a traditional meeting place for Dornish enchanters and emissaries of the Summer Eternals for centuries. The Regio is definitely not under the sway of Elianaris. The Semestones are well known to be frequented by heralds in the service of many different Summer Eternals. However, Commander of the Golden Armies has indicated that she would be prepared to send her armies to seize the reflection of the Semestones in the Summer Realm if the Empire were to build a fane there and cede the site to her. Such an act would please Elianaris greatly granting her control of one of the most prestigious and powerful summer regios in the Empire, whilst simultaneously denying her rivals access to it. Her view of the Empire would be transformed overnight, turning from wrath to joy as quickly as the sun rises. Such a positive gift would be enough to persuade her to throw her weight solely behind the Empire and to withdraw the current support she grants the Yatoon. Of course... Nothing good comes without a price.
If the Empire chooses to cast in their lot with Eleonaris in this way, then it will enrage her three great rivals. Maraud, Cath and Canet, and Jaharis would all be furious at losing access to the Samastones, to the Lion of Summer. It is impossible to be sure what the consequences of that would be. None of these Eternals are the kind of being to ignore such a slight. Their fury is certain to be every bit as intense as the current simmering rage of the Lion of Summer. Thanes. We have added Thane to the list of things the Imperial Senate can commission. It's possible to build these embassies with the cooperation of an Eternal of any realm. Notes. Any of the commissions outlined here could be built at any time. The only time consideration is that Eleonaris's temper will not abate until the Empire commissions something. And the longer this current furore continues, the greater the chance that someone casts Knights of Glory and makes the Lion of Summer even more annoyed. Further reading. Thane. The new kind of Senate commission presented by the Civil Service. Conclave Declaration. Autumn 383 Year of the Empire Declaration asking Civil Service to review embassies for Eternals. Power, Corruption and Lies. Autumn 383 Year of the Empire Wind of Fortune detailing Eleonaris's ban. A pleasing and deceptive face. Autumn 383 Year of the Empire Plenipotentiary Wind of Fortune in which Eleonaris declined a formal parlay. Conclave Declaration. Summer 383 Year of the Empire Declaration Recognising Eleonaris' Assistance Sun Green Summer 383 Year of the Empire Wind of Fortune Mentioning Nessaza's Address Pitiless as the Sun Spring 383 Year of the Empire Wind of Fortune Where Eleonaris' Concerns Were First Raised Eleonaris, the page for the Queen of Penance herself